not going to be able to see me because I'm going to share my screen. Um, and uh, I'm a new board member. I'm, um, I'm a wildlife biologist. I study primarily um, monkeys and apes. And I use camera traps in my research. Um, I use them in a slightly different capacity, but kind of the same idea. So I'm always happy to get to use my cameras. And every time I take down my, take out the little card and I look down the, at the images, it's like Christmas. So I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation half as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you and have some little fun facts to go along the way. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, just holler at me. So without further ado, I'm going to share um, my screen. Can everybody see? Okay. So um, I'll just quickly say that the wildlife section of this presentation, it actually was a group effort. Uh, I was aided, like I said, not only by my trusty Bushnell camera traps, but also by my Lumix camera and photos from UBARU president Michael West and fellow board member Donnie Bunch. Um, I offer photos in no particular order, but I will say that um, over a two month period, the cameras captured over 2000 images. In a three week period, the camera placed near the water trough captured over 1500 images. Water is life. Thanks for the location suggestion from Donnie, and I suggest that you visit UBARU and see what wildlife you can spot for yourself. So, um, so far approximately a third of the camera trap images are of white-tailed deer. You can see that they're active during the day and they're also active at night. Um, there were two native species of deer in Texas, white-tailed deer and mule deer, and we have, there's an estimated 5.3 million white-tailed deer inhabit 252 of 254 counties in Texas. And they can be seen anywhere from green spaces in urban communities to the most rem remote rangelands. And we actually have a couple fawns. Uh, so the next one, um, UBARU has two kinds of squirrels. We have rock squirrels, and they are a kind of ground squirrel. And we also have the eastern fox squirrels, which are a kind of tree squirrel. There are 10 species of squirrels in Texas, and three are residents of the hill country, rock, fox, and Mexican ground squirrels. Did you know that a, fox, that a squirrel's front teeth grow forever? A baby squirrel is called a kit or a kitten, and tree squirrels build nests called drays. About another third of the camera trap images were of raccoons. I think we have a pretty healthy population, but they also love water. I mean, I could I'd start to be, begin to identify um, several groups that came. Um, and we have like, this is one group that came really often. It's a mama and she looks to be blinded in her right eye, but she's got four little ones. Um, raccoons usually give birth to three to four young, which weigh less than a dinner fork at birth. They're called kits or cubs. The newborns stay with the mother for about one year before beginning life on their own. Raccoons can live for 15 years, but most live five to six. So if you look carefully under the trees, you'll see several black animals. They're wild boar, also known as feral hogs. A recent study indicates feral hog populations in Texas number about 1.5 million. Feral hogs are domestic hogs that either escaped or, or were released for hunting purposes. With each generation, the hogs' domestic characteristics diminish and they develop the traits needed for survival in the wild. Feral hogs are omnivorous, meaning they eat both plant and animal matter, and they are especially fond of acorns. Here is our clever gray fox. <laughs> They're both active. I saw them during the day and at night. I was actually surprised to see them during the day. Um, this gray fox, it's the smallest fox found in Texas. They're about the same size as a house cat. And a fun fact, they're the only canid that can climb trees. Huh. 
Uh, so then when we have the nine banded armadillo, um, the armadillo is the state small mammal of Texas. Their lifespan is usually 15, 12 to 15 years. Their armor-like skin appears to be their main defense. However, many armadillos escape predators by fleeing, often into thorny patches from which their armor protects them, or digging to safety. Fun fact, armadillos have the distinction of giving birth to exactly four babies with each litter. But what's unusual is these four offspring are all identical quadruplets. This happens the same way identical twins in humans are born. A single fertilized egg splits, but in, armadillo, in armadillos, the egg splits into four parts, each of which grows up into armadillo with the same genes as its siblings. The young stay with mothers for about four to five months. These camera traps amaze me. So here's our next resident. The rabbit. The jack, jack -tailed, uh, black tailed jackrabbit. Uh, jackrabbits can reach 24 inches long and weigh from three to nine pounds. Females are larger than the males. And this guy likes to hang out by the ham radio shack. <laughs> this is the other um, kind of rabbit that we have. Um, but it, so, and I'll get to that in a minute. Both of these, both the, um, the black-tailed jackrabbit and the eastern cottontail, they're members of the family Lepuridae. One is a rabbit and one is a hare. So what is the difference, you ask? Well, between rabbits and hares, the big thing you, that sheds light on their differences are their nests. So rabbits are born blind, naked, and dependent on mother's care. Their nest is like a saucer-like depression, three to four inches deep and eight inches across. It's lined with mouthfuls of soft dead grass mixed with hair from the mother's breast to hide the nest and keep the young warm and dry. Less than half the young will survive to leave the nest and many others will be eliminated before reaching maturity. Their 85% mortality rate is offset by their reproduction potential. Cottontails may have four to five litters each year with as many as eight young per litter. However, the average litter size is four. What about jackrabbits? Jackrabbits are born sighted, fully furred, and they're able to hop only minutes after birth, so they need no elaborate nest. In fact, jackrabbit mothers, they build no nest at all. They only deposit the young in a shallow depression in the ground or vegetation. Babies from the same litter may be born some distance from each other. Mature females can have two to three litters, with four to six young each year. The average number of young produced by each female is 10 per year. And here's like a, um, two images of the cottontail, the rabbit nest, and you can see how elaborate they are and they keep each other warm. And so here's the next um, guy. We have the Virginia opossum. Opossum is active only at night and is solitary animal. They are the only mammal that routinely dines on snakes, including poisonous snakes. Because of their slow metabolism, they are not as susceptible to venom. They also eat beetles, ants, grasshoppers, grubs, earthworms, lizards, geckos, frogs, fresh carrion, and ticks that carry Lyme's disease. Gotta love those opossums. <laughs> Now here's one of our shire residents, the ringtail, which um, some people call them ringtail cats. They are not cats. They're um, part of the raccoon family. Um, so these are just uh, some images that I got off of iNaturalist, which I want to give a shout out to. Um, both Michael and I have been uploading our images to iNaturalist. And so I'm confident about all of the identifications because people will help you. But these are, you can see these guys during the day. Um, ringtail, they're gorgeous. They're excellent climbers and they're capable of ascending vertical walls, trees, rocky cliffs, and even cacti. They can rotate their hind feet 180 degrees, giving them a good grip for descending those same structures. They have excellent eyesight as well as hearing, both helpful adaptations for a nocturnal animal. And then we have also saw striped skunk. 
Um, they have a lifespan of about two years in the wild, but they have, no, they have very few natural enemies. Like humans, most predators avoid skunks because of the odor of their musk. When threatened or disturbed, skunks make a purring sound and often growl when attacked by humans. Now then I only have, um, so far we only have two herp photos. I urge people to be on the lookout for our resident snakes and lizards. Photograph them and send your photos to me and Robin. This beauty is a harmless black neck garter snake. Um, as many as 25 young may be born in a single litter measuring between 20 to 25 centimeters, making their first appearance in late summer. So Donnie photographed this um, near the meeting house. So um, it's just a baby. So there's got to be way more. So I'm dependent on y'all to see the other friends. And this is the other one that Donnie also cap, um, took an image of. This is an Eastern hognose snake, um, another beauty and everyone's favorite. Um, they're 20 to 33 inches. And they have this little upturned shovel-like nose, which they use to burrow dirt for food. They have a broad head and neck, which flattens and spreads when threatens. threatened. If you pick them up, they will usually, they play dead. Um, if they really don't want to be held, they might kind of poop on you. Um, they, they can bite, but they rarely do. They're just like an amazing docile snake. I keep hoping that I'll see one. Okay, so the next slides are of uh, birds. And um, we have so many birds and when checking with our neighbors to see what else has been kind of photographed in our vicinity, there's a lot more I haven't gotten. Um, so the Northern Cardinal, you know, the male is on the left and the female is on the right. Um, they're, uh, cardinals are monogamous birds that may mate for life. If the pair is able to produce healthy offspring, they remain together for some time though cardinals will separate or divorce if necessary to find a more suitable mate with which to raise more chicks. A mated pair is often seen feeding together with the male gently offering a seed to his mate in a kiss-like gesture. We also have the lark sparrow. Um, unlike many songbirds, the lark sparrow walks on the ground rather than hops. A courting male crouches on the ground, holds his tail up at a 45 degree angle, spreads the tail feathers to show off the white tips and struts with drooping wings, wing tips nearly touching the ground. And we also have house sparrows. House sparrows are said to eat anything. According to the Handbook of Texas Online, they are known to eat over 830 different foods. And then we have the Northern Mockingbird. Mockingbirds can live up to 20 years in captivity and a male mockingbird can learn up to 200 different songs. A mockingbird sings all day um, into the day and into the night. And the lesser goldfinch, the female builds most of the nest over four to eight days while the male stays nearby and watches. She begins by collecting plant materials such as leaves, bark, catkins, cocoons, and spider webs in her bill. She weaves these together into a cup and then lines the nest with hair, feathers, wool, rabbit fur, or cottonseed fibers to complete the dense cup about three inches wide and one inch deep. These guys like to hang out um, kind of just like on the way up towards the, the ranch house um, on the right hand side. And then we have uh, the Woodhouse's scrub jay. Uh, a group of jays is, has many collective nouns, including a band, cast, party, or scold of jays. They are mischievous and have been seen stealing acorn seeds and pine cones from Clark's, Clark's nut hatches. And we also have the greater roadrunner. Uh, the roadrunner snake nest is made of anything the male can find, such as snakes, sticks, snakeskin, and leaves. A roadrunner may produce two clutches a year. When they do produce two, two it's usually um, more common in a rainy year. And then we, we also got quite a few images of um, wild turkey, which I was really pleased to see. Um, wild turkeys have between 5,000 and 6,000 feathers. 
they will eat anything that fits into their mouths. Turkeys almost disappeared in Texas due to overhunting. And then we have the white winged dove. Um, the call of the white winged dove is distinctive with a loud cooing sequence that sounds like who cooks for you with emphasis on the last note. Anybody know who else sings who cooks for you? You can shout it out. Michael? My husband. <laughs> <laughs> also the a bard. Rooster? The barred owl, the barred owl also sings who cooks for you. I don't know if they're at you bar you though. I haven't heard any owls. Then we have um, the black crusted titmouse. Titmouse, oh, do I have to? Um, Robin, can you let somebody in, I think? I got him, you're good. Okay, okay. So the titmouse, they're cavity nesters, and they have been known to line their nests with horse hair, feathers, onion skins, and even tissue paper. Their diet consists of seeds, berries, nuts, insects, and insect eggs. Um, so when I uploaded this initially, I had a different ID. And um, there's a really good birder that lives kind of in the Dripping Springs area. And he corrected me and he told me that these are juvenile birds. And so that black crust sometimes isn't as apparent when they're this young, um, but he showed me how that there's this like buff fontanelle. So there's a lot of really good birders close by and can help us with our IDs. Um, Michael took this, that we have cedar wax wings. Um, their wingspan is between eight and almost 12 inches, that's big. They can fly at 25 miles per hour. Cedar wax wings eat mostly fruit, such as elderberries, service berries, winter berries, mulberries, wild cherries, and cedar cones. And Michael also took this, this is the Beckwick's wren. Um, they appear similar to the Carolina, Carolina wren, but it has a long tail that's tipped in white. And then we have um, the black-chinned hummingbird. In cold weather, the black-chinned hummingbird may ingest three times its weight in nectar in one day. A group of hummingbirds has many collective nouns, including a bouquet, glittering, hover, shimmer, and tune of hummingbirds. And we also have the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, and they can catch insects in midair or pull them out of spider webs. Most hummingbirds typically arrive in Texas in mid-March and depart in late July. And in between mid-November, um, wait, they arrive in Texas in mid-March and depart late July to mid-November to their winter grounds of Mexico and Central America. They fly approximately 1,500 miles. Um, Donnie keeps our three hummingbird feeders full, so he, he would know like when they come and when they go. Uh, we also have the northern flicker. Um, they weigh just under a half a pound. Uh, that's big. Um, they're between, they're almost like 11 to 12 inches long, and they have a wingspan of up to 20 inches. The long bill is slightly curved downward and is used for digging ants and beetles out of the ground. And then we have the golden fronted woodpecker. They consume about as much fruit and nuts as it does insects. Um, in summer in Texas, the faces of some woodpeckers become stained purple from eating fruit of the prickly pear cactus. And then we have the purple martin. They're the largest swallow in North America and one of the largest in the world's roughly 900 swallow and martin bird species. Despite their colorful name, these birds are not actually purple, but dark blue black. And then I have just some insects that I wanna show you. Um, this first one that Haldeman's shield back, it's a kind of katydid. And then we've got this sulfur winged grasshopper. There's a lot of different grasshoppers. So that's another one y'all can be taking pictures of and we can see what we've got on the property. Um, so let's see if this works. Um, so when you're walking up to the labyrinth, you will see these harvester ants. 
And if you go to the outdoor chapel and you sit down on one of the benches and you look under, you will see these daddy long legs or cellar spiders. Uh, and then we have a variegated fritillary. Uh, they produce two to three broods per year. Its size is about 1.75 to 2.75 inches. The females are larger than the males. Uh, they use a variety of flowers for nectar, such as zinnias, milkweed, and butterfly bush. We also have the common buckeye. The females um, are also larger than the males. They drink nectar from flowers um, with a short throat because they have a really short proboscis. The eggs are green and laid singly on host plants. And then we have the American lady. The American lady butterfly has two large spots on the underside of their hind wings. They are medium sized butterflies with wingspan of up to 2.58 um, inches. American lady butterflies are normally found close to the ground unless they are drinking nectar from flowering trees. And then we have the, um, the painted lady butterflies. They have more and smaller eye spots underneath their hind legs. They're approximately two to two and a half inches from wingtip to wingtip. They commonly use some species of thistle as their primary host. They also lay eggs on hollyhock, mallow, and plantain. This is a gorgeous butterfly. Uh, the pipe vine swallowtail, they have a wingspan of three and a half inches. The caterpillars grow to be approximately two inches long. They are well known for their gorgeous blue wings with an iridescent sheen to them. Caterpillars are black with orange colored spines that run down their body. Um, I took this elsewhere, but this is what they look like. Uh, did you know that pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars, they exude a foul tasting liquid. Most animals spit them out right away. If they don't, the animal is subjected to the poisonous acids stored inside their body. Even as adults, the toxin remains and predators learn to leave these beauties alone. And then we have the sleepy orange. Uh, the orange um, upper wings, they're bordered with dark brown or black. However, the top side of this butterfly is seen only in flight because, um, because when it's stationary, the wings are typically closed tight. And then we have the variegated meadow hawk. The variegated meadow hawk is a small to medium sized dragonfly with a slender abdomen, often reaching a length of two inches. The male is commonly dark brownish black with an abdomen of uh, bright red, pink, or golden brown. And my last slide, um, I just wanna shout out to Donnie and Kevin who have kept the water trough filled. As we all know, water is life, um, you bar you wildlife. And thank you for your attention. All right. So I made a few slides here to keep us organized. So this is Brennan and Peter in May. Go. Get video driving out to Beehive. Here's my idea. Why don't we let Brendan kind of explain what that was about and then I'll, I'll feed you next time the videos full screen. So um, unmute yourself, Brendan, and, and um, tell us why you needed to make new frames for that thing and that they needed more space real quick while I modify my situation. Uh, so I'm coming through all right, yeah. Okay, mic's been a bit weird. So the main idea behind that is bees, you really don't treat as individual creatures. The entire hive really is one creature. And they do a lot to self-regulate. Self, uh, self and one of those areas they self-regulate on is how much space they have to expand. And depending on how much space they have, um, that kind of constrains on what they'll do um, to swarm. 
which is where basically they take about half the bees of the hive, a new queen, and they go fly off to create a new hive. The, basically, the hive reproduces. Um, so what, one of the things we were trying to do with giving them more space is if we give them more space, the bees see, oh, we have more, we have more space. We don't need to um, swarm. And that's kind of the advantage of um, what's called the Langstroth hives, which is what we're using is you can control the amount of space bees have and um, to an extent modulate their behavior. Most of what that video was. Any questions for, for yeah, Brennan what, about? What were you spraying with the little, little, what were you spraying in there? Uh, pine smoke, smoke. is Bees communicate primarily through smell. So when and you put smoke in there, it disrupts their ability to communicate. And um, to the most extent, triggers their um, everything's on fire response, which means they're usually paying more attention to try and get as many, try, trying to, um, um, usually you'll see them sticking their head into the frame to start drinking up honey. Because if the hive's on fire, they'll take in a bunch of resources and then leave but what you can do without a beekeeper is if you if the bees think they're on fire they are start paying attention to that rather than you so it keep, usually keeps them a bit more calm so they're a lot like the board if, yeah to an extent <laughs> okay so the borg tends to act a lot more like um termites and ants bees are a bit weird because the queen doesn't matter to them. Um, they're about the closest thing to a perfect democracy as you can get. All the worker bees are really the decision-making mind in the hive. The queen just lays eggs. That's it. And they also have a tendency to be, and my friend puts it, a constant state of French Revolution of they will offer of the slightest provocation. <laughs> I, I will note that as he as he mentioned, uh, constraints of space and, and, and creating a new hive, we did discover at one point a new hive inside a hollow of a tree adjacent to what is now the arts uh, area of the garage, which is near the, the uh, astronomy area. And I had a couple of pictures of that, but it didn't quite make sense to see a picture of a tree with someone pointing to an empty hole saying, well, there were some bees in here. Anyway, I, I will note that, that there, are other, or there are other hives, native hives on site other than the one that we support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I encountered the one you're talking about. They, they discovered the top of my head. <laughs> right. I got a couple of good good stings right on run right on my cranium before I could get away. But they were in there. One of the things that I learned from Hillary when uh she discovered this uh hollow tree group was that when you approach a beehive or a bee nest head on, that the first thing that happens is the the I guess you'd call them the gatekeeper bees. They come out, two of them will come out and they'll go zoom, zoom. And they'll come right out of the hive and they'll hover there and they'll look at you to see, are you friend or foe? And so one of the things I learned from Hillary is that when you approach that tree, if you really want to just hear them or, or observe them, you need to come at them from the side because they have guardians at the door that will go zoom, zoom, and come out and observe you. And she showed us that at our own hives. And then uh, we also saw it when we walked over to the ones in the uh, hollow part of the tree. And at somebody, I forget who it was, banged on the, on the tree. And immediately, two, two bees came out, zoom, zoom. Sounds like Kevin. <laughs> That's really 
kind of typical of um, most animals. Like, so when I'm following um, my troop of baboons, um, I never followed them head on. I always followed tangentially and it's like an act of aggression. So you kind of think about how you're approaching animals in general, that it's not so confrontational. So bees are incredibly smart. So that makes sense to me. Um, Brennan, did you see any kind of communication, other communication with them? I mean, I think that whole waggle dance, I don't know if that's another video, but I think that is absolutely fascinating. Did you see anything about that? I've seen kind of a bit on the waggle dance, yeah. Um, it's on specifically the waggle dance or other communication Whatever you've forms. seen, any, anything you've seen that kind of like that, you know, food's over here and whatever. Well, one of the one of the um, means of communication I enjoy a lot seeing is basically the alarm bell of usually out front or the bee out front of the hive or usually on top. You'll see bees um, stick their stick their basically stick their butts in the air and then start waving their wings. What you'll then see is then there's a little crack that will open at the back of the abdomen. And basically that's the gland that emits what's called the alarm pheromone. So bees that have noticed what's going on will start to alert, will start to basically send the alert and then it will build through the hive. And that's partially what the smokes there dis dis disrupt is to try and keep as few bees from actually catching the alarm pheromone as possible. Um, the other reason why that's at the end of the abdomen is when a bee stings you, um, it will soak that area in alarm pheromone when it when it when it, when it um, leaves the stinger in there, so all the other bees know this is a soft spot. Go here, to, go, go here to do more most damage. You'll see in the next video, Paula, or I think that we had a mean hive, which was the little one they were in, and then there's the bigger <laughs> hive, which we called the nicer hive, and they're going to get into the bigger hive here next, but. Even if they're a nice hive, they still do all this and you can almost see the whole, the whole system kind of ramp up. And Brennan's in an all white suit and Peter's in the white jacket with black pants on. And they are just trying to find a way in because that we think maybe that color gradient between the white and the black. And, and they, I don't know, I asked Peter like, cause they're swarming all around his butt in the video. Like, are they trying to find a way in? Is, does it look like a transition? You know, who knows? But you can, you can really kind of feel the, 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 the intensity of, the, of that many little bees coming at you. So they, they have an incredible fortitude to go do this. So um, uh, shall I run the next one? And then we can, we can talk some more. And I, hopefully. You cut out there. I forgot how straight Connie Wilkins has looked. I'm sorry? I forgot how. That's when he can't put back together too well. Uh, careful on the ready to go. Yeah. Scorpion. Oh, yeah, I see a scorpion there. Well, oh, there's bees up top here. Yeah. Some at least. Wow, there's actually a fair bit of comb up here. Yeah. I think I see some honey in there too. I see uncapped. <laughs> yeah, it's all uncapped on there. Yeah, but there, got stores in it. Yeah. So yeah, we've got brood up to this one. 
Let me check a frame out of that, see if it's just uh, uncapped. No, that's boring. Yeah. That's a lot of brood. Just my brood. I see. The white heads here are baby bees. They're about nine days old right here, and they're drones. They're male bees. You can tell that because of the dome-shaped cover getting put on their cells. I see eggs, too. The eggs here are no more than three days old. Little C-shaped larvae are only a couple of days older. Yeah, you can see eggs. There's, there's a queen. There, I don't actually see any fresh stings in my gloves. I've got one or two. Well, you were actively poking at them, so I'm too smart yeah, that. It's also not like they've been stinging me in the ass. So. Yeah. We'll bend over. We made that mistake before. <laughs> This is a drone, or a male bee. You can tell that because his eyes meet on the top of his head, and he's bigger than the other bees. Drones don't have stingers either. In fact, drones aren't good for much. That's why the hive kills them at the end of the season. Is this the main hive? Which hive is this? This is the, the bigger hive, the nice hive. Okay. The you one that... The woods right across from the um, uh, Friendship Oak. The one you can see, yeah, most yeah. easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you may have wanted to start with that one when they weren't flying. Yeah. A big problem for bees is the Varroa destructor mite. So we need to check out the hive to see if we have mites. To do this, we do what's called a sugar shake. So we collect some bees up, cover them with sugar. Bees here. The sugar makes the bees go into a grooming frenzy and they knock the mites off them so that we can count them by shaking it into the water. The bees aren't real happy about this. But it'll be okay. We'll return them to the hive and they and their sisters will help clean them up. They are trying. After we put this hive back together, we put on some pollen patties, which is extra pollen food for the bees. We also added some sugar water feeders to give the bees just a little bit more food.
Let's get our powdered bees here. Yeah, there's a, yeah, a big drone there. Powdered drone. I'm sorry, what was that slide about the person I need to marry? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so Patricia says some bees are non-domesticated farmed animals. Probably all bees are, but they don't always survive without some management. Um, and bees unfortunately this- but not tamed. Yeah. You have any questions about that video, what drones do or workers do or the capped honey, the capped is their stores versus the, the eggs, which look like a grain of rice. And then they turn into the little C-shaped larva and is that all old hat, good mm -hmm. bee biology. What's all in the pollen packs? So the pollen packs are primarily just pollen they've gathered off of um, flowers that like bees will, it's kind of what the, all the furs for is they'll gather pollen onto themselves, kind of just scrape it back and pack it into the back legs and bring those back to the uh, back, back to the hive. Because the pollen usually acts as kind of the protein source for the bees. They'll actually go in, yeah, they'll actually go and eat that as well. Um, a lot of that gets used to get fed to larva and the like as well. So is it just like a general pollen pack or does it change depending on where you live? I mean, I know some people, um, I've just read something about how that the honey can taste different based on the kind of pollen that the bees have eaten. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, the honey will taste different depending on what flowers the bees are drawing the nectar from. It's, you can get anything from a very dark, like molasses type honey to an almost like green honey, depending on what sort of uh, pollen your your pollen or uh, nectar you're using. Okay. Pollen will mostly be denoted by the different colors you can see, see coming back into hives, as that can just vary depending on what sort of color pollen you find. Sorry, but in the city, you can get Coca-Cola flavored honey and you can get Dr. Pepper flavored honey. And that's not real honey. Well, that's that's what they do. <laughs> they go they go to the cans in the park. Yeah, I mean it's sugar. It is. Don't and yes, local honey is All best. Right. You're right. Any other questions? We've got one last short video if you want to see it about the wax moths and the in the bigger hive. Yeah, maybe two minutes. Okay, here we go. We came back to check on the bees. There are 20,000 bee species on the planet, but the Apis mellifluorus bee, or the Italian honeybee, is the one that we're most concerned with and the ones that most beekeepers keep. Some things worked, some things didn't. There. Yeah, good shot of the smoker. Bring it down a little bit. Smoke. <laughs> we checked on the smaller, meaner hive first, but it's the healthier of the two hives. I got hive tools. We had put feeders on this hive and given them a little bit more space. Checking up on how that worked. There's a whole lot of bees hanging on the inside. There's a whole lot of bees hanging on the inside. Staying on you already. This is uncapped honey. When bees first bring nectar back, they have to dry it out to get to the honey-like consistency that we know. Capped it on this side. Mm -hmm. A little spill there.
Once the honey reaches the consistency that we know, the bees put a cap on it. This is called capped honey here. Remember, honey is the bees' food for the dormant season. Morning on. We also wanted to check on the brood layer to see if the hive is healthy and has a queen. Here we see some brood, which is okay for this time of year. Light. Well, there's still a little bit of... This frame has both brood in a nice pattern and capped honey. This colony was the bigger one, but one we were worried was about to swarm. This is a bad sign. This is an adult wax moth, which is a parasite of bee colonies, and a sign that this colony is in serious trouble. This colony has been overrun by wax moth. Those are the larvae there, and they have killed this colony. So we're going to have to pull this colony apart and take what resources are here and combine it with the other hive. Beekeepers usually lose about half of their hives every year to parasites and other challenges that there are to bees these days. This is what beekeeping is, trying to keep ahead of the parasites. But we're not happy that the hive is gone, but we, uh, the, they, they drove the, the spores that were in that, in that hive um, over to near the observatory. Um, and they, they cleaned up the, the frames over the next 24 hours or so. Um, and then the assumption is that, the, that um, and, and well, Brennan should tell you what they did because I'm kind of guessing now at this point. Go ahead, Brennan. Uh, on what, that they cleaned everything off? Gonna, what, do, are any of the individuals in the one hive going to mix with the other, or is that just a no-go? Oh, yes. Yeah. So what we did with the big hive, since it got pretty badly overrun, is we took most of what, where, what most of where the, the box where the bees were giving and stuck it on top of the other hive. Um, really, it's called combining. Of the, the big hive really isn't able to support itself anymore. So the idea basically is we take what mass we have the other hive, give it to the other one. The idea basically being put a piece of paper in the way, they chew through the paper. Hopefully by the time they chew through their paper, through the paper, they treat each other as just one hive worth of bees and try not to kill each other. So do, do we now have just one hive or at one time yes. we had three? We one time we had three hives. And so now we're down to one? Yep. Uh oh. Made, it's it's kind of to be expected. What made the one hive more susceptible than the other hive? Um, so the best guess we have is the big hive swarmed. So it took about 50% of the bees and left, which meant there was, it went from basically being this full to this full. And that's kind of what wax moths do of uh, the larval stage of the wax moth really likes um, honeycomb and honey. So wax moths will come in, they'll lay their eggs in a frame. They'll hat hatch out and they'll go chewing through uh, the comb. And usually, it's really only an issue if a beehive has um, just empty space that they can just go hang out in, which that hive had a lot of. Was, I think, uh, didn't you also spot some swarm cells? There was some big kind of globs on that one edge of that frame. Is that right, Brennan? And in those yeah. swarm cells, there's a, they're treated differently. And it, there's an indication that that, that might be coming. What other, yeah. did you see something else in the big one in May that indicated they might be swarming? 
not enough size. Okay. Most of what well, most of what we saw. Okay. Um, as to what swarm cells are, is they're basically new queens. Is they're bigger because the queens are a substantially larger bee. Is they'll put cups on the bottom of the frames, and they'll grow new queens in those. So once a new queen hatches out, she'll go through and kill all the rest. Um, and then the bees will then take the old queen and a bunch of bees and fly out and leave the new queen with what's left of the hive. Primarily how that how, how that works. Other questions? Is there anything else you can do to prevent the wax moths from um, coming into that first hive? I mean, aside from space, is there any kind of a, like some kind of a smell they don't like? I don't know. Um, most of it is, ju is just space. Optimally, the idea would have been once to, to try and um, it check, catch when the swarm leaves and then reduce the space in the hive down to where the remaining bees are actually able to um, care for it, rather than just leaving them with that much space. But didn't not out there often enough to actually do that, so kind of why the wax moths moved in. A, a strong hive will fight them off, Paula, and it, it, they're not an issue if the hive is well and strong. And the little varroa mites, similarly, um, you, if you yeah. if you treat the hive for the varroa mites, I think you end up damaging the bees as well. Um, it's kind of like treating a fungal infection in people. It's sort of that arms race of kill you or kill the fungus because we're so similar. Um, but the sugar shake, that's, you can get an indication of how much of a varroa mite infestation you're looking at by doing that sugar shake. And, and, and I think there might be a few options for treating things, but, but they're tough. Because it's kind of the thing, uh, varroa mites, wax moths, and uh, little beetle species, usually it's referred to as hive beetles, are almost always present in hives. Most of these parasites are just there. You just kind of have to depend on the bees to keep track of them. Um, there's a couple diseases that will just outright just kill a hive if, it show, if they show up, uh, which is um, a little bit of beekeeper etiquette for you. Um, I mentioned hive tools, which are basically these little pry bars I was using to pull up the frames. Um, those, are, those are kind of important tools. Um, but one thing you do is you never take them with you. Um, um, a beekeeper, if you go visit another beekeeper, they should always have a spare set of hive tools on them. Because and so you don't have to bring your own. Because if you bring your own and that happens to have um, uh, diseases on that, you don't want you you don't want to take that anywhere near someone's um, hives, because there's a fungal disease. I think it's I think uh, I think it's European foul brood is the nasty version of that, and the spores of that will just get into everything. And there is um, I have seen one way to actually get rid of it off of equipment. And that was back in North Carolina in a, um, in a basically a facility that was designed to clean um, space germs off of, uh, off of uh, lunar, lunar lander equipment is the only way to actually get rid of that stuff from equipment. I have a question. Hmm? So during the video, it said that the, they make honey, that's their food and they, you know, they make it up so they can have it as, as a store for, yeah. to get them through the winter. So why do humans take their honey? And are we killing the bees by taking their honey? Or does this make them go into a frenzy and produce more honey? Or what happens? So what's kind of special about, because there's, as, as was said in the video, there's about 14,000 bee species about two dozen of those are classified as honeybees. Um, Italian honeybee being one of them. There's a Russian black bee, there's a germ bee, there's a couple of African species. Um, those are classified as honeybees because they are capable of producing enough honey 
that humans can actually take that honey and really not detrimentally affect the hive. Um, I mean, the bees will go through a lot of honey, but specifically for like Italian bees, if there's a nectar flow, if there's every, if everything's flowering, if you just keep giving them space, they will just keep filling it with honey. Um, they are perfectly happy to keep making honey as long as there are resources. And it's kind of up to the beekeeper to measure out um, how much honey they can actually take to leave to leave with the um, uh, leave with the bees for their downtime is usually winter. Um, I learned back in North Carolina where the winters were usually more um, usually a little colder. They need about 40 pounds of honey for a good sized hive to be able to make it through the hunt through the winter because they don't do anything during the winter. They just kind of sit in a big ball and shiver is all they do during the winter. <laughs> that is what we do too, yes. <laughs> yeah, so really uh, we're not affecting, um, we're really not affecting them by taking honey, assuming it's okay, effectively thank harvested. You. Thank you. So there are some bees that don't produce honey or they just produce a very small amount? So things like bumblebees, carpenter bees, aphis bees, um, those basically every bee species. Um, so apis mellifera, the, the Latin name for bees. Um, the Italian one is usually, I think, apis mellifera mellifera or something like that. It translates to basically honey-loving insect um, because that's kind of their notable feature is they create honey. So even I think Bumble, I, I think you know, carpenter bees are the solitary bee. So they live alone. They don't actually have hives. They'll still create honey, but it's like a teaspoon, a uh, teaspoon. It's, they create very little. It's kind of how that works. I don't know. I got plenty of honey facts. <laughs> I think everybody's tired. I think we've overwhelmed them. <laughs>